I think we can maintain, it's another word, we can restore another word, and therefore I think we need a, a new lexicon, uh, because uh, today's nomenclature is conceptually different. Yeah? The definition, I, primary prevention, people don't like it, yeah? because we need to reinvent uh, words and uh, have a new lexicon. So, um, because the main focus today of nephrologists was retarding the progression of diagnosed and established disease and the treatment of kidney failure with a replacement therapy, and there was so far no focus on preservation or salvage of kidney health, therefore this controversies conference is new among all specialists, and their excuse was that there are no data, there is little research. Yeah? And uh, all guidelines so far uh, KDGO produced are focusing on individuals with established GFR, uh, kidney function, or uh, CKD with kidney function below 60 ml, and albuminuria categories. But um, what do we have in the moment? And we have exciting times, and we have now in sh the short future four foundational therapies for kidney outcomes. We use them for secondary prevention, for preventing progression of kidney disease, but this is new, yeah? especially for SJT2 inhibitors, we have to walk out of these three CKD trials, and maybe GLP-1 receptor agonist, we also have to move out flow, but flow will give us a label for GLP-1 as the fourth uh, pillar, and uh, the question is now with cardiologists and, and to, to discuss them how many we need are all in, in uh, three months. So, but th the task of today, uh, what was given to me, is actually to stay here, to stay in this range. And there is a paper out there in JAMA just recently which also addresses these questions and uh, goes in the same direction to maintain kidney health. So um, the established thing is clearly, and we have a focus on this in our work group, to use lifestyle. This can be easy, translated to everybody. Uh, however, we may not be very successful. On the other hand, if you look at weight, and I heard today from Julie Ingelfinger that the rich people in the world may be able to control their weight in the future. And if they control their weight by GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, they may have also the potential to maintain kidney health. Because if I look at this meta-analysis of Navid Sattar with all the GLP-1 receptor agonist cardiovascular outcome trials, then there is the kidney in the secondary endpoint with a heart outcomes. But the shift of the point estimates left of unity to make this endpoint significant has, been, has came from albuminuria, macroalbuminuria, albuminuria included in the endpoint. And only flow now has established this maybe risk reduction, what we get from flow, uh, because the kidney was with heart kidney outcomes in the primary endpoint. So flow will give us the data, but in later stages of established kidney disease. Yeah. So GLP-1 receptor agonist, and we, we can dig out the components of reversal of albuminuria and the shift to um, better kidney health or stabilization of early disease. So when I talk now to general practitioners, I use cartoons, and one is here. And uh, we have a patient 55 years old with type 2 diabetes, and his speed to travel through lifetime to end of life is already only because of one risk of, of diabetes moderately accelerated. Yeah? He is losing three months additional loss of lifespan per one year due to type 2 diabetes alone, and I was looking into the data of the JAMA publication, I, and I see some kidney disease within this group um, giving us this um, message, and maybe the kidney is accelerating the speed 
up to three months additional loss of lifespan. And this, is, uh, this model uh, does not need to have UACR measured. Uh, alone, the, the risk factors is accelerating this travel, and I see also the same message in episodes one and four, which came out, which has many elements of this in the New England Journal of Medicine. So um, Alberto already showed us data from MPAREC outcome. Uh, I didn't know this, so I am using different data sets. The distribution of individual EGFR slopes in the total cohort baseline to follow up, and these 7,000 people had cardiovascular disease and the minority had kidney disease. But uh, this cohort was traveling with 1.8 ml per minute per year uh, towards an endpoint. Yeah? And if you treat these people with empagliflozin in empa cohort, you shift the entire curve to the right, so everybody is benefiting. Not only those with uh, on the left side of the Gauss distribution. And the interesting thing is, they move to 0.3 ml per minute per year, and this is below what Alberto showed us, the average loss uh, of life um, of we, we lose every year. So what's going on there with, is an SJT2 inhibitor now preventing uh, the aging process uh, in part? Yeah. So um, I used this slide then to bring a message out there, what we may can use. So it could, we could translate this into a patient plus a family history equal to an SJT2 inhibitor before metformin, for example. Yeah. Could be uh, something we can distill from this data as a consequence. And then in preparation of this meeting, already people ask questions and they then prepare data and publications. And here is one, shifts in KDGO, CKD risk groups with empagliflozin. Same thing, data from the EMPAREC outcome now pressed into uh, KDGO risk categories and these other journals, Journal Diabetes Complication, they bring up cartoons like this to educate people outside nephrology, yeah, shift towards the green basket. And if you look on the bottom of proportion of patients who experience change in UACR or EGFR categories, and uh, this is a two-to-one randomization in empa kidney, improvement in KDGO risk categories by declining UACR and increasing EGFR, there are proportion of people really would uh, maintain or going towards uh, healthy, more healthier kidneys. In this group uh, of cardiovascular outcome, uh, cardiovascular disease people. Let's go to the evaluation of the EMPAREC outcome data in terms of uh, people without albuminuria with micro and macro. And you can see that uh, after a certain dip in those with preserved kidney function, you can have a stabilization of kidney function and the curve is uh, crossing at about 94 weeks. So even in those with well-preserved kidney function, uh, giving them an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, may have uh, benefit. And those with macroalbuminuria, they traveling by seven ml per minute uh, per year towards dialysis, this is known. So this is not a phenomenon now of empagliflozin. It has nearly been reproduced, uh, I do not use the word identical, but similar, or nearly, this is nearly identical in terms of numbers, in, with canagliflozin. And if you go to dapagliflozin in the next, uh, and I apologize, the colors are not my production, they come from Itamaras, and I copied this. And if you go to regression on the bottom, People who move from micro to normal albuminuria uh, are substantial in, uh, in the DECLARE study. It is also a group uh, with low cardiovascular risk, so early on uh, kidney health, and you can reverse this process. Let's move to another example I just 
touched a bit. Let's go to EMPA kidney, which is advanced kidney disease, uh, non-diabetic and diabetic kidney disease, and on top of these bar graphs is the median GFR, so this is far advanced. Empagliflozin uh, reduces the progression of ML per minute per year by 50%. And on the right-hand side, I see again the same thing in EMPA kidney that I see in the other SJT2 inhibitor trials. Uh, far right are the so-called macroalbuminuric yeah, uh, reduction by relative reduction by 43%, which is substantial, but relative reduction, not absolute, relative in those without albuminuria is much higher and the slope is 0.1 ml per minute. In those with established disease, you bring them uh, to a stabilization. Yeah? So even later stages, this process can be um, the, um, stabilized. And with the other um, foundation therapies, phenerenone, we uh, just generate this data in the moment, and GLP-1 needs to be uh, also evaluated. So when we have these on the right-hand side, the macroalbuminuric people or those with UACR above 300 milligram per gram, then you can just use another cartoon. With EGFR, you determine the position, and this, these people are traveling with high speed towards uh, the cliff. So all these analyses, when I summarize them, they show that patients at lower risk, many of whom in their lifetime would otherwise develop kidney failure, could benefit in terms of preservation of kidney function. If widely implemented, use of SJT2 inhibitors could therefore have a substantial impact on the public health impacts of CKD. And parts of these sentences are copied from the New England Journal episodes and other journals. So many people think in this direction. And I think the, the easy way for our work group is just to uh, focus a bit more on SJT2 and then take the others. And then we have uh, Ron Gansevoort among us who did the Thomas study in the Netherlands. And the, the question was there, should we go for population-based screening to detect people at risk? And should we not better define individuals in the general population at risk to screen and treat early? So you can see uh, the value of population screening in this study. It can be done. UACR can be brought at the door of the patient. What does the we mean? For me, the we, in, the we in this paper is that we have to go to general practitioners, so we are moving out of nephrology. Maybe not everybody likes this, but that's the way to go when we go for population screening. But there's one thing, maybe we get this explanation later from Ron uh, Gansevoort, that uh, those who were identified in the general population 50% found the way to the general practitioner and could be treated. And the other 50% who did not go, they had more obesity, lower EGFR, more diabetes, and these are the people we want to see. Yeah? And uh, so there is a little bit of disconnect in these strategies, and we need to talk about this. When we had our telephone conferences, group three, we uh, automatically walked to the topic of group two, because we have to concentrate now on the intervention. And the question is, should we now, which group we should target? And we discussed during our telephone calls the, some factors that define early risk of CKD and pro potential treatment target population. So you see uh, now a, a few factors of diabetes, their consequences, morbid obesity in uh, special societies, uh, pre-diabetes, gestational diabetes. We heard from Julie Ingelfinger, I called it adverse intrauterine child conditions, yeah, where we, we may have already a metabolic imprinting of the diseases of the mother. CKD in families, uh, ethnic minorities were um, mentioned, uh, gestational age, preterm, high blood pressure, preeclampsia, toxins, which are now becoming more and more uh, for, to the fourth in this world. Uh, the risk at ICU, the young men in males in Central America and other factors. 
And I just was reflecting about this risk population, which is more easy now to propose some early treatment in these high-risk people or people who most likely develop CKD. And I found that we are already treating those. For example, Fabry disease, we prescribe enzyme replacement therapy to prevent onset, and we spend a lot of money out there. Yeah? And uh, we now introduced adjunctive treatment in those. And if I look at the pyramid, and I, I can see that we prescribe statins in type 2 diabetes without cardiovascular disease based on risk but we do not prescribe SGLT2 inhibitors in type 2 diabetics without comorbidity so far. So there is a bit of an interesting comparison where we may move from the statin of the 21st century uh, to bring this into the mindset of people. And then I was thinking again uh, what we can give KDGO, maybe regrouping the top 11 factors, and then I came with three categories that's better to sell, uh, then 11 factors, three categories is better, and I group them in metabolic diseases or some intrinsic, extrinsic, multifactorial, and environmental, the same factor. So maybe we can use this in subgroup, or subgroup two can use this and discuss and develop it further. And then uh, the many uh, monogenic risks uh, justifying an early adjunctive treatment. So why not using an SGLT2 inhibitor in those with lysosomal storage disorders or Alport syndrome, what we already heard? They will develop disease, uh, and why not giving them adjunctive, also antifibrotic treatment? These are in part fibrotic pathways and use um, the four foundational treatments in these patients. So in my talk, what was missing, I did not go into mechanism of preventing CKD, the tubular stress, uh, I didn't address biomarkers, but we have uh, colleagues here who can do this. Consumption of kidney functional reserve was also on my plate. Uh, more focus on non-CKD trials with SGLT2 inhibitors, incretines, anti-inflammatory therapies to identify more of these subgroups who carry a risk for a CKD development yeah. and uh, the healing process I didn't address in the future of personalized medicine where we tackle specific forms of kidney disease uh, which target causal pathomechanisms to stabilize nephron loss or kidney volume. So this can be also used. I'm coming to the end. There is uh, already a, a future which you can predict. Uh, we design currently new studies, new approaches. Um, they retard progression of kidney disease, but we can build in early uh, stages, early groups, uh, in broad population with established disease. Subgroup analysis of such trials may also provide relevant data. Here are the current three pillars and the 2025 pillar, the label which will come to us will be GLP-1 receptor agonist. And then we have a, a still a residual risk and we are currently, I think we get the endothelin receptor antagonists by maybe 2026. And the new trials with aldosterone synthase inhibition and uh, um, soluble guanylase cyclase activators maybe in 2023, 2030. So uh, we walk from uh, maybe all in in a certain number of days time to personalized medicine in the future. And this may also influence our uh, discussion today. However, there is a big elephant in the room, the unpredictable future, which is the change in demography Asia will be um, affected um, dramatically, the longevity in all parts of the world. Uh, we talk about uh, climate, changing climate, the heat waves in the future and the environment which bring us toxicity. And I learned that air pollution also affects um, kidney function and uh, impacts on progression. And uh, there will be more conferences in the future. I just end with one. We will have one next year with the Japanese Society in Nephrology on Kidney Health in Aging and Aged Societies. So that's a different focus. 
Um, and uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>